Good morning. I'm going to share for a few minutes. Andrew's going to come up and share for a few minutes, and then we are going to do communion. I was listening to a sermon this week, and I had heard a verse that I'm not sure I'd heard before, and it just uh, was something that got me thinking. So I want to share that verse with you. It's from Isaiah 49, uh, verse 14 to 16. In the, in the, I was listening to a sermon and, and the individual was talking about, uh, talking about the goodness of God, talking about how just some maybe, I'll call them the ways that we can be a bit misled. And he was just really encouraging people to come back to meditating on the goodness of God and to know uh, that the love of our Heavenly Father and to really have that be the focus and it was good, and so he shared this verse in the context of that, and it says, But Zion said, in verse 14, The Lord has forsaken me, and the Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? And that part struck me because of the stage of life that we're in, and I've seen this even recently where Theo will just be having a tough time, and when a child is screaming or crying a lot, it can, you know, stretch one a little bit. And I may be hitting the end of my kind of line with all this and then insert the mother. And the mother comes in with just like, <laughs> you know exactly what it sounds like. I would be very embarrassed. But just the way a mom approaches that nursing child, just, and I'm just like, blown, I'm like, amazed amazed I was like wow that is not how I probably would have responded in that moment but just comes in with love as though that child is just an angel and they they are they're a child they're an infant but they're screaming and says oh you're so cute you want to eat something you know how exactly how it is right and to the dad it's just like you know you're losing it but it says in this verse, it says, even, so there's that, and you think of how a, a mother cares for a nursing child, but even, it says, even these may forget. So even beyond the care a nursing mother has for a child, even a nursing mother could forget. But he says, but I have not forgotten you. Behold, I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands. And it just really is a powerful verse. You think about the love that God has, and obviously, prophesying when he says I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands I think prophesying about Jesus sacrifice on the cross and so just an amazing picture of how much God cares for us and so as I was thinking about God's love for us and the loving heavenly father I was I was drawn back to something that I'd shared on a number of months ago when we were at the retreat and I just was thinking about the goodness of God and uh, just kind of drew me back to that and yet when if you if you were there at the retreat you may you may remember some of the thoughts that I'd shared with you around the goodness of God and and again I come back to this and I think wow it's such an interesting thing to meditate on the goodness of God I'd shared with you this verse in Psalm 27 at the end of Psalm 27 David says I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and I'd asked you this question that I'd been asking myself was about it's interesting that he says I would have despaired unless I would see it as though it was coming. But in saying that I'm hoping or looking forward to the goodness, seeing the goodness of God, it, it implies that I'm not currently experiencing the goodness of God. And when I went back and I read this whole Psalm today, I, it was amazing to me. You read, and there's a number of very familiar passages that come out of this Psalm, but then you start to put them together. It's, it paints an interesting picture I want to share with you. So starting in verse 4. How many have heard this verse? This is David. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. And in my mind, when I hear that verse, I really, I feel like that verse just strikes me as where our focus needs to be. When we think about why it is that we serve the Lord or why it, what is the goodness of God, I think of this verse as a great, it's like, I just want to behold you. Lord, I just want to be in your temple. I don't want to leave. I want to meditate on your goodness. I just want to have my eyes fixed on you. That's all that matters to me 
is just to be in your presence. That is to experience the goodness of God. Is to just, it says this is eternal life. It's just to, to know him. But you think of this, the picture that David paints, or the Spirit paints through him, of just being able to be in his presence. And, and then, you know, it was maybe a physical thing, right? You'd go into the temple. But now we can experience that. When we are walking, each of us probably knows what, or if you haven't experienced it, but many of us, I think, have, where you just, you just have experienced the nearness of God. There's a verse, I believe it says that, the nearness of God is my good. So this is his heart's cry at the beginning of the psalm. He says, Lord, that's what I long for. I just want to, I just want to know you. I want to be in your presence. So then just a few verses later, he says this, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. Do not, you have been my help. Don't abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. Clearly, he's going through some challenging things. And it's like, he's almost like, hey, God, like, don't forget the fact, you told me, seek your face, and I did it. I did what you told me to do. Now, why is it that it feels like you're, abandoning me like are you angry with me why are you doing this don't forsake me aren't you supposed to be the god of my salvation it's like a pretty stark contrast to three verses later where he's like he's crying out lord i just want to be in your presence to this and then we skip a few verses later and we get to that one that i started with where he says i would have despaired unless i'd seen the goodness of the lord in the land of the living and then he says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. It's, it's amazing to me, but I, I just, I'd ask you this question. Are these things totally disconnected? Is there any chance that what he experienced in the second, so think of this as three sections of this psalm. The first, the heart cry, Lord, I just want to be in your presence. The second, where he's like, Lord, What's up? Have you forsaken me? Like, I've done what you told me to do. And yet now, what, are you angry with me? Literally, it's like, what is going on? To then saying, oh, I still believe I'm going to see his goodness. And I just, I'm going to put this out there. Is the middle section the answer to the first? And I say this in the context of Job because I'd read this recently, I may have said that, I read through the book of Job. And remember, at the end of all that Job goes through, he loses, financially he's ruined. He loses all of his children, the greater one, clearly. He loses 10, he has 10 kids, he loses them all. And then he, he loses all of, his, all of his finances. He's ruined. Even his wife says, just curse God and die. And at the end of it, we know that most of you remember the conclusion where God comes and starts to, challenge Job like on some of some things and in the end Job says this he says I had heard of you with the hearing of the ear but now my eyes see you like it's it's though you get this picture he says like I have come into a deeper place of being in your presence Lord like I I I had heard of it but now I've seen it. Those are two different things. It's like somebody telling you something, say, oh, have you heard of this or that? One person saying, oh, I heard this story, and another person saying, I was there. Those are two different ways of experiencing something. And so this is, you get a different, different impression of this. And I was thinking, because in James, he says, consider the endurance of Job. He says, in the end, he is merciful and compassionate. And he is. You remember how the story ends? It's like 40 chapters covering the heartache. And one half of a chapter that covers the mercy and compassion. And it's true. God is merciful and compassionate. Incredibly merciful and compassionate. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is his heart. This is why he came. He came for the brokenhearted. He came for the sinner, obviously. Behold, he came to save sinners. I talked about that a few weeks ago. He came for those who are hurting. 
I reread some of the sections of Matthew 1 this morning, and you, we've talked about this before. You know, we talked about how Jesus in his lineage is Ruth, the Moabite. Then you have Rahab, the harlot. But I think the most crazy one is Judah and his daughter-in-law. Like, Jesus comes through grossness. He's not ashamed to come through just a sick line in some cases. He knows, like, he, I just, I look at that and I, Lord, I, there's so much I'm sure more I could understand. But all I can think is he came for the brokenhearted. He came, he wasn't ashamed to come through just a crazy line. I mean, even the way he came, many would have thought he was born out of wedlock. People would have just assumed that, right? Jesus wasn't afraid of that. And I just think of this, but why, in all of this, what I want to come back to is just meditating on the goodness of God that we see as a body an individual, like we understand that he is, as he said to Abraham, he said, I am your exceedingly great reward. That we would focus on knowing him and a deeper walk with him, that our heart cry would be the same as David's. Like, Lord, one thing I ask, all I want in this world is to be in your presence. Each day of my life, I want to walk with God. I want to walk with you. I don't want anything to separate. But to recognize that in that heart cry, and in him saying, come to me all you are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We have to be really careful of how we interpret what that verse means. Because it would be easy in our mind, in, our, in I'll say our carnal mind, to interpret when it says, like, or it says in Hebrews, he says, like he's warning people, hey, be on guard that you don't come short of entering into the rest of God. And, and to think, like, what does that mean? And our now, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of rest? It's like ease. It's, it's like no trouble. Like you can think of this at home with the kids. It's like, oh, they're in bed. And you sit down on the couch and you put your feet up. and like, no, this is, I've just entered the rest. Like, you know, that's what your natural mind thinks of. And, and yet, is that what God was thinking when he said that, right? Ah, oh, this is what I have for you. It's just a life where you can kick the feet up, be around the 70 date palms, and just, it's a life of ease. But I just, it's such a warning there. There's such a warning in Psalm 27 of seeing when David cried out and said, like, Lord, I just want that. And then so quickly after, he's like, Lord, I've done what you said. Are you angry with me? Where's my salvation? And not to realize that that probably was the very answer to the heart cry. When he took him into that place of whatever it was, Saul chasing him through the wilderness and thinking, this is it, I'm going to die. And to realize God was saying, if you really want to be in my presence then I'm going to take you there, but it's not necessarily going to be an easy road because you don't come into his presence and learn to live a life of dependency and just a nearness and truly experience the goodness of God without surrendering your will to him and saying, Lord, you don't want to say it, but you, you are saying it. Lord, whatever it takes, I want that nearness. I was thinking about Job and James. I, was, I said this and I, sorry, I got scattered, but he says in there, he says, consider the, consider, consider this story. And the part that struck me this morning is it's so easy to read that story. And then it says, and then God doubled his wealth, gave him back 10 kids. His, his daughters were the most beautiful women in the land. And you almost get this picture that it was like that. Like the story went from heartache to no problems overnight. But I started to think about that. And I'm like, it didn't. Unless the gestation period for a baby was like nine days and not nine months. And it took, you know, you think of these children growing to an age where you would have seen it. There's a father that would have experienced heartache for years of thinking of the loss of his children. And he probably would have said, I could care less about the money. But now all of a sudden, all these cattle came back to him and all he had all the herds. But there's a father that went through years of heartache. But in the end, if you'd asked Job and said, Job, tell me about it. 140 years later, tell me about it. I 
I believe strongly that he would have said, I came to know the nearness of God like I never, ever, ever would have without that heartache. And so I would encourage you when it says we need to consider it, we need to consider it. Like we need to think about it and just say, Lord, what's, is there more to that story? I just want us to know, I want each one of us to know the goodness of God. And that doesn't mean that by saying that, I want each one of us to go through incredible heartache and trial. That's not at all. The reality is, though, some will. We see that in our own bodies. Some will. But when we think about, wow, I, I, my heart, I think each one of us would say, as, we, as one or some go in our body go through difficulties, the loss of a loved one, sickness, whatever that might be, is that they, we would not lose heart. And just say, brother, sister, I am praying. Come alongside the hurting and the brokenhearted because that's, Jesus came for them. But to recognize too that in the midst of that, let's not lose heart. Let's see, Lord, in this hurt, it hurts so bad, whatever it is. Lord, let me, let me, let me know a deeper sense of nearness to you because there we experience the goodness of God. There we experience it. The goodness of God, I guess the, you could summarize a lot of it just saying the goodness of God is not necessarily natural blessings. <laughs> and that's where our mind can so quickly go, and I think the devil can so easily deceive us when things don't go well financially, health-wise, so many things. And we can say, we can almost be, we can quickly, our flesh can become like David. Like, are you angry with me? What's going on? I feel like everything I touch goes wrong, Lord. Because that's kind of what David was saying, it feels like in there. And God could be saying, just trust me. My ways are not your ways. They are a lot higher. And remember you said to me, you wanted to know what it means to spend every day in my presence. I'm trying to take you there. I'm trying to take you there. Trust me. And so just a thought, a few short thoughts to just consider as we, you know, we desire to, just to know each one of us to know the goodness of God in such a deep way, to know him in a deeper way. And it's hard. I share this. It's like, wow, this doesn't feel like the goodness of God. But the reality is, it's just maybe just to say, let's, hey, what does it look like? Every time over the last three, four, five, six months, I come back to thinking about the goodness of God. I do feel challenged to say, man, does my natural mind want to take me to a place of thinking about what the goodness of God looks like that is different than what the Lord has in mind? And the goodness of God, what, what, is he believe, what, is he, what is he saying when he says to, to experience the goodness of God? What does it look like to experience the abundant life that he came to give? And it is to experience the fruit of the Spirit. All those things are true, but we have to be on guard, I think, about just thinking like defining it one way, saying what it, and getting focused on this is what the goodness of God looks like. And if he doesn't deliver that, then what? And we just have to be cautious of that. But I just encourage you, God is good. And what he wants, he wants us to have such a deep and personal relationship with him. And he desires to take us there. And we, there's where our faith comes in, is to trust him on that journey and say, Lord, I don't know necessarily what it's going to look like, but I trust you that your ways are so much higher. And I trust you. And I know that in the end, you are merciful and compassionate, no matter what you allow me to go through that you have good. Even think of this verse, Jeremiah, I'll leave you with this, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Not to, it almost sounds negative. Do you know what the verse before that is? <laughs> when you spend 70 years in Babylon, <laughs> he says, by the way, I'm going to take you through a really big trial, but in the end, no, this is the plan I have for you. Right? And it's interesting, when you think of these verses, we often quote Jeremiah 29, 11, and we leave out 29, 10, right? And it's just a thing, just realize that. So as God is taking different ones through different journeys, man, we can pray and we can come alongside and seek to lift up and to bear and to encourage and whatever God puts in our heart to build them up, that we as a body would say, yeah, there, this is, oh, that we would know his nearness. Oh, that we would know his nearness.